to the audience out there in uh, Zoom land, I really appreciate you sticking with us uh, uh, during our technical difficulties. Um, this uh, talk has been on the calendar for some time now, and um, I'm so glad Techy Arcus and Elsa can um, help us uh, understand what they've done uh, today. It's uh, it's a very interesting paper that you you can look up on Pub, PubMed, of course. Um, so today, um, Tacky Arcas, um, assistant professor in oncology and health uh, sciences informatics at the school of, at School of Medicine and Balsamo Ananastu, um, also an assistant professor in oncology. Um, are presenting uh, their work. Uh, they have some co-authors, I'm sure they'll mention them. Um, but I am so pleased to uh, welcome both of them, um, both um, natives of Greece, as I understand it, both graduates of, let me try it, National and Capodistrian University of Athens. And uh, they've both uh, done some additional training here at Johns Hopkins. So I, I welcome both of you. I'm not sure who's going to begin first, but, but you may share your screen at any point. Perfect, thank you, uh, Norma. Um, and a great pleasure, obviously, to be here and see folks that are uh, starting to join. Apologies again about the technical uh, difficulties. I'm Elsa Agnostrum, an assistant professor with the Thoracic Oncology Group, uh, and I'm a lab scientist. I'm focusing on uh, large-scale genomic and multiomic analysis to understand uh, response and resistance to cancer therapies. And that's the Arches. Um, hello, uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm Taxiakis Botsis. I'm an assistant professor of oncology and health sciences informatics here at Hopkins. Uh, today, we'll be talking about the study on a new visual storytelling framework for knowledge dissemination in biomedicine. And I have to uh, acknowledge here Jennifer Fairman uh, from the Department of As Applied to Medicine and Megan Moore from the Bloomberg School of Public Health, who were both critically involved in this study and uh, will participate in the discussion at the end of the presentation, I believe. Um, so this work was triggered by the gap in communication between researchers and the general public, uh, as well as the fragmented dissemination of scientific findings. Uh, often, non-experts feel disconnected from significant discoveries and are struggling uh, to understand complex, com complex concepts. More often uh, than we like, we, as scientists, choose complex data visualizations to communicate our findings to a narrow scientific audience. Here is such a figure. Uh, this is a figure of uh, networks, uh, network analysis findings that are visualized in a very and a highly technical manner that suffers from multiple weaknesses. The overall design here is inefficient and poor, poorly relays the underlying message revealed by the data. This is a very cluttered figure as it includes various elements and lots of text. Furthermore, it contains more than 10 colors, which is a significant violation in information visualization. A longer legend is necessary to explain it alongside with a very lengthy technical description of the main text of the related manuscript. This is a figure I constructed myself back in 2015, and I felt good about it at that time. Six years later though, I'm still enthusiastic about the analysis itself, but I have to admit that this is a very bad figure and very difficult to interpret as well. Uh, on the same note, this is a figure uh, summarizing cancer genomic findings from analysis of cancer DNA sequences that Elsa and colleagues published recently, uh, targeting an audience, of, an, audience of, an audience of experts. This is certainly a better and well-designed technical visualization, however, it remains complex with multiple elements and dimensions, as you can see here. The small text is not helpful uh, and long in text explanations have to be used in the companion manuscript. It certainly works for the experts in this particular domain, uh, but we uh, have to be, uh, uh, very, very cautious when we take that to the broader, broader audience. Such visualizations, like the ones we uh, uh, showed before, uh, while they summarize findings for a narrow technical audience, they do not communicate our findings efficiently to the public or even our peers outside our immediate research field. 
We particularly see this in clinical practice. Physicians and other providers use medical jargon uh, that builds up a gap between them and their patients who do not really understand information that is critical for their care. This gap can be bridged using efficient information visualization approaches. And this is what we, uh, we have explored here in this study. Visual storytelling in particular is emerging as a powerful communication tool and may bridge the communication gaps that we have been discussing so far. So let's start with a story and see how uh, uh, the visual storytelling works practically. Our first story is about vaccine safety. There will be two stories in this presentation. Our first story is about vaccine safety, uh, which, is, which is historically and uh, a very intensely debated topic. As scientists, we cannot really take sides in favor, in favor of vaccine opponents or vaccine uh, supporters. With this in mind, we will present a visual story that illustrates both worlds, one with and one without vaccines. So let's start with the story. Uh, according to CDC, all kids have to receive most vaccinations within their first 18 months of life. Kids feel very uncomfortable with vaccinations and parents can be very nervous as well. They do realize the benefits of vaccination and may be concerned about the potential risks, or sometimes they are completely opposed to the idea of having their kids immunized. One of the first vaccines administered to, uh, to children protects them against rotavirus disease, a very severe condition that causes diarrhea and vomiting, and in some cases may lead to death. One of the potential side effects of the rotavirus vaccine is that is the susception. And the susception occurs when a portion of the intestine falls into another segment, like a telescope. This unfolding results in bowel obstruction that can lead to severe intestinal injury if untreated. The first rotavirus vaccine, the Rotacil vaccine, was approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration in August of 1998 and released to the market uh, in October of the same year. The administration of Rotacil vaccine to infants in 1998 was associated with about 15 interception cases until July 1999. At the same time, CDC recommended the uh, Rotacil suspension and the manufacturer ceased the distribution of the vaccine. The product, the vaccine product remained in the market until October 22nd, 1999. Many adverse event cases were reported for the Rotacil vaccine and reviewed by the CDC and the FDA. That was a significant portion of the total number of cases submitted for all other vaccines in the market at that time. A closer look at the Rotacil adverse event cases reveals that the interception threat peaked in July and August of 1999. It is also very clear that many more adverse events were reported during the vaccine life cycle, uh, excluding the susception. Although not se as severe as in the susception, they did synthesize a safety profile that eventually led to the products withdrawal from the market. So what happened after 1999? Were the infants in the United States and the world safer? I apologize for that. So it's really happening here. It appears we have a Zoom bomber with the initials DN. It's possible to you kick out the individual. Bitch. It's possible to kick out the individual uh, DN. Yeah, let's kick your mom in the ass. I think it's like it's better. Yo, James is such a snitch. Is Nicole able to do that? I'm not a, a co-host. If I can be made a co-host, I can do it. Yeah, I think it's this guy right here. <laughs> okay. There we go. Well, that was a data visualization that none of us needed to see. Yeah. <laughs> How is this possible? Isn't this supposed to be a secure link or no? I bet if you stop sharing screen and then reshare, that that will go away. Maybe. 
Yeah. Okay, I'll try. And I'm that. sorry, who is the host here? Is it Norma? interesting <laughs> there we go that was the first for me um and i'm sorry is norma the host here and is the yes she is yes norma's the host sorry i was talking while on mute oh no worries is the individual now out of this yes out. Okay. Okay. norma isn't this a hopkins uh, secure link I, mean, I don't understand how this is possible yeah, I'm not sure. It always it happens you know, quite we, regularly. We did have uh, Zoom difficulties um, in initially setting it up, so um, you know it's a it's just a bad experience all the way around. My apologies. Okay, let's keep okay. going. Um, so I'll probably start with the previous slide just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So a closer look at the Roda Shield adverse event cases uh, reveals that the deception threat peaked in July and August of 1999. It is also clear that many more events were reported during the vaccine life cycle. Uh, and the question here is what really happened after 1999? Were the infants in the United States and the world safer? So according to WHO statistics for the rotavirus diseases between 2000 and 2006, the rotavirus mortality rate in children less than five years old was high in many regions, especially in Africa, Asia, and Central and South America. Interestingly, although the situation in some African and Asian regions did not really change, the numbers in the following six years, and particularly the period, the period from 2007 to 2013, dropped. So what happened in 2006 or 2007 to explain this difference? As explained above, the Rotacil vaccine was withdrawn from the market in 1999, and until 2006, no rotavirus vaccines were available. In February 2006 and April 2008, two new vaccines were licensed and made available. Some may argue that the new vaccines protected thousands of children worldwide and decreased or even eliminated the rotavirus threat in many regions. Others might say that nothing really changed in Africa and Asia. WHO statistics support both views. It is also a fact that the health systems in many African and Asian regions are underdeveloped, and the access to medical products and vaccines in particular is problematic. Another fact is that the elimination of smallpox and diphtheria coincided with the introduction of the corresponding vaccines. Similarly, the number of reported cases for other diseases decreased dramatically compared to the 20th century. So uh, do benefits outweigh risks or is it the other way around? We hope that this story has shed some light on this topic. So we just finished a visual story for a timely manner, vaccine safety. We built that particular story around the Rota Shield historical example because it is widely known. There is so much data for this particular product. So we have so many opportunities for analysis and data visualizations. It is also uh, it may also very nicely support the visual story if combined with additional information. So based on that, we define a visual storytelling as the combination of multiple media, photographs, illustrations, video animations, three-dimensional models and other graphics with text and or audio to create powerful and compelling stories for selected target audiences. So uh, the goal in visual storytelling uh, is the successful communication of scientific findings to the target audience. And this success really depends on, on many factors. However, no efficient story can be built on complex data and flawed analysis. Assuming that the two conditions are met, reliable data and thorough analysis, what is really the strategy of making a good story? And let's, let's take a closer look. Uh, before going there, uh, we should keep some, some background. Because there are two fields, the health, the health communication and the infographic fields, that may form some basis for this exploration. The, the health communication field has shown that storytelling, uh, that storytelling can facilitate improved understanding of health information and better, and better outcomes. Megan Moran from the School of Public Health, an expert in the health communication field and co-author in the paper, 
has helped us shape the related principles and incorporate them in the proposed framework. Also, the infographic community that focuses on multi-section visual representations of information intended to communicate one or more specific messages is a second field that can support this analysis and this work. So our proposal leverages work from both fields and is further inspired by some old and modern theories. We start from Aristotle to cinematography. So Aristotle was likely the first to talk about efficient communication and he specified three elements for the excellent communication. He specified that ethos, pathos, and logos are the three elements for such a communication. Ethos is tightly linked to the communicator's credibility. Renowned experts. Renowned experts do not really have to prove their knowledge, ability, and familiarity with multiple topics, or even demonstrate their ability to conduct systematic analysis and lead top quality research. Logos, uh, which is the second element, is about building and presenting log logical arguments when communicating essential, essential messages. The starting point here is the analysis itself. And as long as it is thorough and complete, it can easily support logos. And the third element is pathos. This practically refers to the emotional aspects of a story. A presenter and a storyteller may elect to keep pathos at the lowest level or maintain and balance with the other two elements, or even develop a, a story with a box on emotion. Movies, on the other hand, uh, generally have a set of opening actions to introduce viewers to a story, a build up in the middle where the main action is taking place, and a happy or, or even sad ending that concludes the story. There are quite a few similarities with scientific stories, we believe, because scientific stories should also start with an informative introduction to the main theme. They should have a complete description of the key findings next and end with a clear take home message. But how Aristotle's theory should be implemented into scientific, st scientific stories? What is the appropriate degree of ethos, logos, and pathos in the three, in the three sections? In our opinion, ethos and logos should be at the highest level throughout the full story. The story and the team behind it should establish ethos initially and maintain it at the same level in the following two sections. The analysis, findings, and arguments are generally not shown in the beginning, but rather in the middle and the end of the story. And how about pathos? How should we handle pathos in a scientific visual story? Should we start low and increase emotion throughout our story? or keep it at the lowest level, given that we are interested in showing data and findings objectively without expressing any positive or negative feelings. Most times, this is not a matter of personal selection, really. Regardless of our efforts to maintain objectivity at the right level, the topic itself may be so controversial that it will raise the audience's emotions to the maximum. And a good example is the, uh, uh, the story for vaccine safety. And let's, let's talk about this story again. Uh, we will practically see how this theoretical framework applies uh, if we read it on the storyboard and analyze the section in particular acts here. So as you can see here, this story consists of 12 acts that include photography, area plots, choropleth maps, tables, brief text, and other components. A short introduction of two acts, a middle section of nine acts, and an ending part of one act compose the storyboard. We begin with two facts. One about CDC's vaccination recommendations, this is the first act, and one for the actual challenge that inspired the visual story. And this is about the, patient, the, parent con, the parents' concerns about vaccination risks in the second act. The middle part unwraps the analysis results and additional information that sheds light on the problem. Given the focus on the susception, we start with an illustration that explains the condition. This is the third act, and then moves to the rotasil example. A visualization of the Rotasil vaccine life cycle with the announcement of the withdrawal of this product from the market, this is the fourth act, support a smooth transition to the data analysis section. In this act, we initially present some statistics using data from the adverse event cases reviewed by the CDC and the FDA. The number of all adverse event cases submitted to the, uh, to the FDA and the CDC for all vaccines, uh, the 42 vaccines, and the Rotasil alone during the rotor seal life cycle are presented in the airport. And this is the fifth act. This data presentation illustrates the relatively large number of rotor seal reports and sets the tone for the next act. 
Normally, the audience expects to see more details about this increased reporting. This is accomplished with a, a, a new area plot that first zooms into the rotasil subset and second embeds a bar plot with the actual number of interception cases per month. And this is the sixth act. The different scaling of the y-axis in the new area plot, as you can see here, we have uh, from zero to 100 versus the other uh, scaling in the previous plot, in the previous act from zero to 2,500, may confuse viewers in a side-by-side -side comparison. However, it is necessary to allow, to allow for a clear and more focused presentation of the data in the new plot. Rescaling is generally not recommended in visual stories and information visualization in general and should be avoided unless it is absolutely needed. I think that this is an exception. We are now at the first turning point in the middle part of our visual story. We have just presented a vaccine product that caused a serious adverse event to 100 infants and was subsequently withdrawn from the, from the market. So what happened after that? How was people's health affected without any protection against, against rotavirus? The WHO provides data about rotavirus mortality rates uh, in less than five-year-old children after 2000. So we use this data set to construct a choropleth map for the period immediately after rotacil withdrawal until the release of the new vaccines in 2006. And this is uh, in act number seven. This map shows that many Central and South American, Asian and African regions suffered a lot over these six years. This is the second turning point of our story. Did these ugly statistics improve after 2006? Using the same WHO resource, we construct a second choropleth map with the statistics for the period after 2006, shown in the, uh, in the eighth act. It is evident that status didn't, did improve with the release of the new vaccines, which is described in act number nine. The two maps further indicate that regions with either weak vaccination programs or inadequate access to vaccines still suffer. The use of the choropleth maps in a side-by-side -side comparison uh, on act number 10 is beneficial. Repeating essential information and visualization components in a visual story is an excellent strategy to emphasize findings or even help the audience view the data from different angles. Now that we are getting close to the end of the story, we need to speak about other vaccines or vaccination, vaccination in general using actual data. In the last turning point of our story, we present a table with the impact of vaccines in the 20th and the 21st centuries using data that is publicly available by CDC. And this is the uh, 11th act. This clearly shows that immunizations have nearly eliminated certain viral diseases in the United States. The ending part consists of one act only, and this is the, the very last act here, number 12, that raises the question about immunization uh, risks versus benefits and really calls the audience to action. And uh, one may ask how ethos, logos, and pathos play out in this story. It should be clarified that we did not really conduct any study with any target audience or audiences to examine and quantify these elements. So we cannot really make any formal or objective evaluation. We could argue though that ethos and logos are the highest levels, given that we use top quality data from federal and international uh, sources and presenting them in clear charts with really no manipulation. Pathos is a big question in this story. Although we do not really intend to take sides or manipulate audiences' emotions, the topic itself may take people outside of their comfort zone. And it is very likely that, for example, the two photographs in the beginning of, uh, of the story, especially the second one, take pathos to the top level. The subsequent poor acts uh, likely take the pathos uh, down to a lower level, and the two choropleth maps maximize that again up here. The following three acts in the middle section likely keep pathos medium to low, and the ending slide is probably at an average level. Again, this is not a systematic observation. Uh, it is more like an example of how things might work for pathos, despite our best of our intentions to not really uh, manipulate anything here and play with, with pathos. Uh, so uh, Euripides, our Greek ancestor, said that a bad beginning makes a bad ending to illustrate the importance of the introductory part in Greek tragedy. In visual stories, this is really uh, the part authors build the credibility of their presentation and determine the levels of pathos, if there is any pathos. A successful introduction should present the state of the art on the topic, capture reality, and summarize the key aspects of the main theme. 
The structure of the middle uh, part depends on goal and audience. When a visual story serves educational purposes, it may rely on the simple presentation of results with plain emphasis on the main findings. When a story is about controversial, controversial issues like the vaccine safety, it may work best to incorporate contrasting components into the middle part. Finally, a successful landing part should summarize the main findings and present the key message to the viewers. It should show the, show the following steps uh, and also discuss if the new results open new directions for research or even change the status quo in the domain or affect people's lives. At this point, one might ask whether there are any tools to support the design of good stories. As a matter of fact, there is relevant work in the infographics field. Here is Alberto Cairo's uh, visualization will. Uh, Dr. Cairo is one of the pioneers in information visualization. And this will shows the characteristics of inf inf infographics of, on, on six bipolar axes. Complex infographics aggregate characteristics that place them at the upper pole and the target audience mostly consists of scientists and experts. On the other hand, the lower pole, uh, the infographics in the lower pole are, are shallower and they target non-experts. Let's very quickly review the two poles of each axis. The first axis, this is abstraction versus figuration. The infographic here contains conceptual components versus components mimicking reality. The second axis, functionality versus decoration. Uh, the infographic will use incorporate components serving the didactic purposes of the intended use versus aesthetically pleasing components. The third axis, densus versus lightness. We have components including a lot of information versus components including small amounts of information. Uh, the fourth axis, multi-dimensionality versus unidimensionality. We have components with many levels of depth versus components that focus on one parameter only. The fifth axis, axis originality versus familiarity. We have components focusing on the original presentation of information versus components being closer to audience's comfort zone. And the last axis, novelty versus redundancy, we have a single component on one hand presenting multiple findings versus many components explaining the same finding. The visual story development practically includes four major phases. First, the identification of the target audience. Second, the evaluation of audience's literacy. Third, the visual story design. And fourth, the visual uh, story production. It should be noted here that Although the data collection analysis phases, phases are paramount in scientific stories, they are absolutely separate from the storytelling part and are not discussed in this presentation. So uh, we should always start by determining our target audience. Although there are stories that may satisfy the needs of multiple audiences, it is a good strategy to build one story, having a vague idea of what, at least a vague idea of what our target audience is. Each story transmits one or more, more messages and receivers must be synchronized to get them clear and without any noise. Being aware of the real needs of our audience is a guarantee for a good start and the ideal basis for the next step. It often helps and maybe even recommended actually to interview the consumers or our visual story, discuss their explicit needs and attempt to identify their implicit expectations. Even when we build a story for experts working in the same scientific area with us, we cannot take as granted their familiarity with our particular data exploration. It is also unlikely uh, uh, to develop stories for, for experts or audience with various, various levels of uh, educational att attainment. We have to be very careful there. It's a very challenging process and requires special design considerations. Uh, in the second step, uh, we should always measure audiences health literacy, especially when the group consists of lay people. There are quite a few tests to support this, this particular task. We here propose uh, the newest vital sign, which is very simple, where the end user reads specific scenarios and has to answer six questions. Its answer is scored at either incorrect or correct. And when four or more correct answers are given, health literacy is, is, is high. Less than four correct responses signify low health literacy. Moving to the story design uh, phase, we are looking at five main steps. In the first step, we'll start with uh, the problem statement. It may look oversimplified uh, for, uh, for you, but it does help to summarize the challenge and the problem we have to solve, as well as our main goal. So for example, an audience of lung cancer patients who struggle 
to understand the potential benefits of immunotherapy could be educated through a visual story. In the second step, we can diverge from the main goals and take a deep dive to define the sub-goals that may contribute to the overall design. Using the previous example, other more detailed sub-goals might include developing an interactive web-based visual story with powerful illustrations and graph plots. Um, some draft sketches, uh, or in the case of interactive modules, a wireframe, may better illustrate the sub-goals and evaluate it in a converging third step. In an ideal design phase, there should be an opportunity to run sketches by some of the members of our audience. This is the optional fourth step in this phase. This usability testing will assist us in generating the visual story prototype, which is the fifth step, and then push that to the production phase. The design phase can be uh, supported by the use of a dedicated design tool. We here propose using a multi-axial visual storytelling board that includes the axis from Cairo's visualization wheel with a scoring system to quantify them and generate a total score, as you can see here. This tool further incorporates the newest vital science test mentioned before and specifies our design decisions. If the newest vital science score is equal to or above four, for example, an audience with high health literacy will have to create a visual story with a total score equal two or above 12, with most acts aggregating the upper core qualities in the visualization wheel. The opposite applies to audiences with uh, low health literacy. So here we have many acts with lower core qualities and a score less than 12. It is very obvious that simple stories would work well for high health literacy audiences. However, it is preferable to challenge these groups with some complexity. The uh, newest vital science score specifies our particular decisions and selections for each axis in the visualization wheel and the total score as well. As a rule of thumb, the score in any of the axes has to be lower or equal to two in the case of low health literacy audiences. If this rule is violated, for, so for example, if we, have, if we have three very dense acts, we will have to minimize the score in the other axis to achieve the right balance and uh, reduce the total score. We'll not really go into further details here, but want to emphasize the potential combined use of pa and power of existing tools to support the design process. To, finally, to convert a sketch to an actual product, we have to select the appropriate components. There are practically no strict rules here on the number of or type of components, the length of any text or the format of the medium. Keeping the right balance, we have to pay attention to the style, using the right layouts, colors, and Fonts. Quite frequently, data visualizations are not readable by people with vision uh, def deficiencies, for example, and our color palette must respect that. Also, special considerations are necessary uh, when we have embedded information visualizations that constitute standalone visual stories. And then, Elsa will start talking about uh, the second visual story. Elsa? Else is on mute. Please unmute here. Elsa's on mute. Um, oh, there you go. Elsa, we don't hear you yet. Uh, you, she's, she's still on mute. You have to unmute here. Okay, I can, there I'm okay go. now, thanks, thanks Norma. Uh, so uh, let's go and and uh, I think Texier, because if you can go one back, I believe, yeah. um, that's perfect. So so let's go through um, a second visual story. Uh, the target audience here are lung cancer patients and advocates uh, who may be familiar with immunotherapy, but are not too familiar with the emerging technologies uh, used to interpret therapeutic responses and help with uh, clinical decision-making and, and treatment selection. So the, the following uh, uh, visual story is an example of how scientific findings presented in a scientific or medical uh, journal publication uh, may support 
a visual story for high health literacy yet non-expert non uh, audience. And we used one of our fairly um, uh, recent publications uh, looking into the dynamics of tumor and immune cells during immune checkpoint blockade in non-small cell lung cancer and reconstructed the scientific narrative and data visualizations that I'm, I'm actually summarizing here. This is from the original paper. We did that in order to make these more digestible by a non-expert audience. And this is a story of 11 acts, as Taxiarchis would, would say, with, uh, with illustrations, uh, slope charts, graphs, and text. And it starts with a short introduction uh, describing the immune system, uh, then uh, we, are, uh, we are explaining the mechanism of action of immunotherapy and how the immune system is activated by immunotherapy to uh, attack tumor cells in lung cancer patients. Uh, and, and then we provide a layman description of liquid biopsies uh, and uh, the utility of circulating cell-free tumor DNA as a non-invasive means to understand uh, clinical responses to therapy. And then the middle section, uh, is in five parts where we show how circulating tumor DNA uh, levels change in, in the bloodstream over time um, uh, during immunotherapy, and then highlight the uh, advantage uh, of, of liquid biopsies versus conventional methods for determination of clinical response to, to cancer immunotherapy. Uh, and at the end, uh, the story introduces uh, the concept that Changes in circulating cell-free tumor DNA levels are reflective of clinical response, and specifically that patients with uh, clearance of CT DNA uh, have a better clinical outcome of, of immunotherapy. Uh, so that's the summary of it. Let's go over the, the visual story. Uh, and apologies, if, if folks can mute their mics, uh, there is some return. Uh, that'll be fantastic. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, Norma, perhaps you can mute everyone except for me. Sorry, apologies for the multiple uh, technical issues. There was a slight uh, return. So again, the goal here um, was to tr transform a highly technical approach that is longitudinal analysis of circulating cell-free tumor DNA uh, that is used to interpret a highly complex biological uh, phenomenon that is the anti-tumor immune response. And we wanted to convert this into a compelling visual story um, targeted to a non-expert audience. Um, this was uh, a challenging task um, that required a fine balance uh, between relaying adequate information, not too technical, but also not taking away from the sophisticated approach and, and, and study design. And um, as we were kind of scratching our head in terms of how effectively do the Shout out to Jenny Furman from the Department of uh, Arts as Applied to Medicine here at Hopkins. And Jenny is a visual problem solver. And together we tried to visually simplify complex concepts. And these efforts resulted in a series of illustrations um, that, that we're showing here. And so we're starting by introducing what the immune system looks like and why the tumor immune system interactions are key for tumor recognition and, and rejection. And you will notice that in addition to the visuals, uh, a short description in, in lay terms uh, accompanies each panel. And this is shown on, on the left-hand side of, of each illustration. After grossly describing the cellular elements, uh, the cells of the immune system, uh, we introduce here incremental details about how the immune system may recognize and eliminate uh, tumor cells uh, as tumor fragments practically are recognized as foreign by the immune system. And that triggers a foreign body response uh, that if effective can result in, in tumor clearance. And then uh, after we introduce the concept uh, that um, uh, after we, we were done with, with, with initial uh, uh, descriptions and basic concepts, we introduce the concept here uh, that tumor cells uh, can hijack mechanisms that are in place to avoid autoimmunity and practically emit a, 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 a do not destroy signal to the immune cells that allows the tumor cells to avoid elimination. And finally, introduce at the right-hand side here, 
um, the mechanism of action of a specific class of cancer immunotherapy called immune checkpoint inhibitors that practically releases the breaks on previously confused immune cells, now allowing them to, to clear tumor cells. And of course, as we all know, cancer immunotherapy and immune checkpoint blockade in particular are revolutionizing um, uh, cancer therapeutics. However, uh, what we wanted to relate to the public is that we need molecular biomarkers to navigate among uh, treatment options that have to do with immunotherapy. And more importantly, uh, we need sophisticated molecular approaches uh, to rapidly and accurately monitor response to, to therapy. And of course, molecular profiling of blood, also known as, as, as liquid biopsies, this has gained momentum. Uh, in, 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 this, in this field. Um, and that's what we are introducing here, uh, where we're showing that tumors routine, uh, shed um, uh, uh, free DNA into the bloodstream, which can then be quote unquote biopsied uh, by means of a liquid biopsy compared to, uh, to traditional approaches. And this liquid biopsy uh, can be analyzed to provide valuable information, such as changes in the genetic material associated with the patient's cancer uh, during therapy. And again, in this visual, what we're showing is the linkage between the tumor and the circulating DNA that can be extracted from, from blood, amplified sequence, bioinformatically analyzed, and ultimately interrogated for, um, uh, for, for the presence of alterations uh, or known as, as mutations. Um, and again, in the next one, uh, there, there is gradually progressing flow of, of information building on the uh, basic concepts of circulating tumor DNA liquid biopsies, liquid biopsies um, now bridging liquid biopsies with uh, response to cancer immunotherapy. And what we're highlighting here is that responses, it's, it's tough to to monitor responses to immunotherapy by imaging, but with liquid biopsies, uh, we're potentially coming up with an alternative way to rapidly and accurately uh, determine responses uh, to therapy. And the next one. Uh, so, so then um, moving on to the one of the major findings of, of, of the study, which was quite difficult to show in, 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 in um, uh, in a digestible uh, and lay uh, way, um, we're trying to show that distinct patterns of, of circulating cell-free DNA changes uh, in the cell during therapy, these are reflective of clinical outcome. And so what we're showing here is that for patients that have a drop uh, that is shown um, uh, with the line graph here, uh, for, for patients with a drop of, of C, in ctDNA, these patients tend to achieve long-term clinical benefit from immunotherapy, and, and, and these responses are detected early on during uh, the treatment course. But if one looks at the next graph, which is just looking at, um, at dimensions of cancer lesions on, on imaging, um, what, what one can, can immediately appreciate is that for, for a lot of these cases or a lot of these patients, there, there's no change. Um, and so imaging does not adequately capture uh, tumor clearance. And similarly, in patients that, uh, uh, that do not respond, uh, that do not respond to, to therapy, here cDNA or liquid biopsy trends are also very clear and um, uh, show limited practically change uh, or rise after therapy. And this is a very consistent pattern uh, that 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 is that is shown here. Uh, again, if one looks at imaging. Um, which is the next uh, uh, graph, uh, tumor size again here remains uh, the same. So, so with that way, we're trying to contrast the two, uh, the two approaches, uh, which is the molecular approach and then the more conventional radiographic approach. And summarizing uh, the value of liquid biopsy is uh, in, in predicting outcome with, with immunotherapy, uh, we're using simple bar graphs uh, to show the, the relatively longer overall survivals just purely, which is the, the, the blue bar, um, uh, in, in individuals with liquid biopsy, with liquid biopsy determined responses uh, compared to, to non-responders. Um, so uh, as we go closer to the end of the, of the talk, uh, we want to summarize a few key points. Uh, we presented a study that defines a new theoretical framework for visual storytelling in biomedical sciences that may change 
we think current thinking on scientific data presentations and knowledge dissemination. We have proposed this framework inspired by Aristotle's ethos, pathos and logos and cinematography. Uh, these elements, along with adjusted tools from the information visualization and health literacy areas, play a critical role in the design step, as we mentioned before. We particularly crafted and presented two visual stories, uh, two examples, and we think that the overall approach and the, the design choices in each case, in each story, were different, and uh, it was in accordance with target audience challenges and goals in the corresponding problem statements. Uh, we know that we have some limitations here. There are three limitations in this study, the generalizability, completeness, and validation. First, there might be some criticism on the generalizability aspect, especially given that the description, uh, we have the description of two, uh, we have two, two visual stories, we have just a few data sets. We believe though that those two examples demonstrate the applicability of our theory to different scenarios and use cases. Second, the current work does not really include principles for a construction of three-dimensional pieces, or even the full specifications for the determination of target audience. However, we have covered quite a few aspects, we think. The third limitation, the validation limitation, is really important. We haven't really validated the proposed approach in a study with real target audiences. And we, we know that this is a serious, uh, serious limitation. However, we plan to release that in future extensions of this work. And uh, we, uh, we, we see two future directions practically. The first is the visual storytelling crafting. crafting. The focus should be placed on the use of more tools and interdisciplinary collaborations. The target audience understanding is the second direction which is very critical, very important. As we mentioned before, the levels of health literacy and numeracy significantly affect the visual story design. Most visual storytellers though, uh, simple or complex, they have to contain statistical charts, maps, diagrams, or other visuals that present data. Uh, William Baltzin coined the term graphic acid to describe all that, to describe one's ability to understand these forms. So if the target audience doesn't really have this capability, we have to educate the target audience. Visual stories in biomedicine uh, should not be used as the means to obscure ideas on people. As in scientific papers, storytellers, tellers, uh, should clearly separate the objective description of scientific findings from any personal view and take no sides. We should also have in mind that if people mistrust, mistrust the institutions and researchers that generate scientific data, they will, not, will never accept the visual stories that communicate them. Uh, we can probably agree, all agree, that scientific papers and other media are not always transparent or even compelling to non-experts. Many scientists consider the publication of scientific findings top priority are not particularly interested in the dissemination methods. Although this is understandable, we believe that the efficient presentation of important research uh, through visual stories is important. It matters a lot for the success of audience understanding. One might also ask whether biomedical scientists should bring on board graphic designers, storytellers, information visualization and health communication experts, or even artists to assist them in creating visual stories for their data. Uh, I think that this is very similar to the involvement of biostatisticians in high profile studies to guarantee the correct analysis of biomedical data, to maximize the, the quality of scientific presentations and efficiency of knowledge dissemination to the public by either building a visual story or not. We definitely need to involve experts with formal training in all those fields. At this point, would like to acknowledge the great work of folks in our, in our labs uh, and our collaborators in thoracic oncology and um, uh, the division of biostatistics. Uh, and this work would not really be possible without uh, Jenny's and, and, uh, and Megan's involvement. So thank you. Uh, we are uh, happy to take any questions. Right? Thank you so much, uh, Tech, the Ar Arcus and, uh, and Elsa. Um, we, we do have time for some questions. So do you want to raise your hand if, or you can just unmute yourself? I've unmuted, it, allowed everybody to unmute themselves. So. Uh, 
Let me get started, Takiarkas, uh, a question for you. Um, you mentioned you haven't evaluated this yet with your target audience, um, but you had the target, target audience involved in, say, each of these uh, stories in developing the graphics and such? Um, not really. Unfortunately, we didn't have uh, the opportunity to involve the target audience in any of, of, of those visual storytellers. Uh, visual stories, we, we, we just assumed like the needs, the actual needs of the target audience. Uh, the actual conduction of a thorough study to evaluate that really requires considerable uh, investment on, of, of funding and other resources, and we don't have any resources of the kind available. That's, 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 that's a limitation for sure. Yeah, I always wonder about graphs and um, what's your general experience with literacy of graph graphs to communicate, you know, the up and the down aspects of, of treatment. Um, so I'm not aware of any systematic study around this particular topic. Uh, I know that in the health communication field, they do work with target audiences, and, and, and I'm pretty sure that they evaluate the appropriateness, appropriateness of, the, of, the, of the media used for, for those stories or those presentations. Uh, but really, going down to the evaluation of particular graphs, I am not aware of any systematic study. And Elsa, a uh, question for you. Um, have you tried this with patients, uh, you know, as a way to explain your therapeutic options. Oh, dear. She's on mute. Um, it says, can you unmute yourself now? I can now, perfect, okay. yes. And I actually wanted to, to make a, a, a point on, on your question to, to Taxiarchus, because I think this is, this is a very, very important point. You know, uh, these visualizations were put together based on our perceptions in terms of, you know, uh, what the uh, patients or patient advocates or the audience, you know, would, may want to, to see. Uh, but of course, and we've had long discussions with Jenny, Jenny Furman uh, about this, and, and uh, I would welcome her uh, thoughts and, and, and comments as well as she has significant experience in actually communicating uh, in effective ways with, with different types of audiences. But the next step, Norma, as you're saying, is actually um, uh, engage uh, with either with, with with the target audience, right? Uh, for for us, it is our lung cancer patients or, or or patient advocates. And and an interesting question here, and what we will be uh, doing as follow up is actually uh, showing uh, the target audience, patients, patient advocates, uh, whatever it is, uh, the original illustrations, right, in the scientific in, in the scientific paper, and then the reconstructed um, uh, illustrations, and ask them to. Them based on you know the very uh, nice approach that the taxiarchy showed with the, the with, uh, when he was talking about the wheel uh, right um, uh, looking scoring practically different components that have to do with complexity uh, of illustrations. I think this is a very important next step. Uh, this is something that we typically don't have in mind, right? When we put these uh, these um, uh, illustrations uh, together, and uh, we welcome uh, any interaction uh, with with um, with our patients and, and patient advocates because they need to be uh, you know ultimately everything it is uh, we do we do it to improve outcomes uh, you know their outcomes and and we want to to, to to give back to them right so so all of our science and, and research is actually uh, um, um, serves uh, serves this goal. Uh, Jenny, what, what are your thoughts and perhaps uh, challenges that, that we've uh, encountered uh, throughout this journey? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. You know, oftentimes, um, you know, to approaching these types of things, um, audience is always the first thing we consider. And um, we're not always um, able to have access to that exact audience. And so we um, oftentimes have to make assumptions based on what other research has told us in terms of um, literacy and accessibility of the audience. Um, uh, uh, there, there are, um, sometimes we're lucky enough to do studies on such things. Um, in fact, recently I was working on another paper with another colleague about um, 
you know, like what is what what, what do audiences respond to the most um, in terms of like, for example, um, still versus motion and um, also 2D versus 3D. So there's a lot of different facets to it. Um, but from our, you know, from the perspective of a medical illustrator, oftentimes we're, we, we consider, we're considering, you know, as I said, the audience, but also accuracy, um, engagement. Um, and, um, and then also we, um, we look at some of the learning theories that are out there. So oftentimes we look to cognitive learning theory to inform the best choices um, in plan, you know, in the planning stages and the sketch stage, um, you know, in order to really put together a very clear story um, so that the audience that's receiving that information can understand it and not be distracted, but rather gets the message. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answered the question, but. <laughs> Well, I can see how um, how this story, this example story that you showed, uh, could be modified a bit um, to uh, talk with people about the importance of blood samples and maybe even storage of samples and willingness to store samples and and such. Um, so it's a slightly different population, of course, it, because it could be people who have not gotten a diagnosis of cancer yet. Absolutely, and uh, we didn't show this today, but uh, that's exactly, so we want to engage, right, with, with our patients, patient advocates, engage them also with uh, you know, the research that, you know, that, 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 that we're doing. And um, uh, there is an effort within thoracic oncology, and I'm sure, you know, in different uh, disease groups, uh, to put together educational material or quote unquote educational material uh, that describe the ongoing uh, research. And we just showed a very small piece of it uh, today. Um, uh, and in, 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 in layman, you know, in kind of lay terms, uh, so that uh, they can uh, further engage with, uh, with our efforts. And then, and then it's very important that they feel part of this, right? So they, they, they donate uh, biospecimens they, and they're, they're an integral part of, uh, of, of our research. And that's something that I think can be effectively communicated uh, via illustrations. Mm -hmm. And we, so, we should probably also emphasize the power of uh, interactive visualizations or interactive visual stories because everything we demonstrate here is, is very static. But just try to imagine that you have, uh, you have patients with high or low health literacy and you have the exact same data and you have the exact same story you want to tell, but you have to tell that differently uh, to, uh, to, to, to different target audiences, people with different levels of health literacy. And interactive visualization, interactive visual stories uh, may significantly contribute to that kind of education and training. Right, right. So often, often we just aim for the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, I'm just thinking the medical record now has the area deprivation index, which um, one component would be education. Um, but also income, you know, a general measure of wherewithal, that might be helpful in, in looking at who your target audience is, say, at the, amongst the cancer patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions, folks? Anna, there is one question in the chat uh, that I think relates from Joe Mari. I think it relates to what Taxiarchus was, was talking about uh, uh, about uh, to to an extent about interactive um, uh, um, visualizations or, or whatnot. Can you see this? Yeah, I can. I can just kind of reiterate. It's yeah. it's kind of about the how you know folks are digesting information, right? In this concept of presenting a visual story, and you know, especially during COVID, we talked a lot about how patients or not even patients yet, but folks are trying to get public health information to are digesting things in email or social media or other platforms that um, where there isn't necessarily an expert like helping them guide through this process, which is how we often think of patient interactions like in a clinical setting. It's very different. And so I, I 
I, my question is about how do we approach, you know, visual storytelling in these different, and not only based on the audience, but the context of which they're engaged in the information. I think, I think you both, both addressed the question already through, through how you answered the other questions, like using different forms of media. And, mm -hmm. and I like the idea that um, Taxi Arcus was mentioning regarding using an assessment to kind of see where folks are at and meeting in there with the right visual story uh, to, to convey the info. So really, yeah. really cool stuff, guys. I love it. Thank you. And I think, again, we have to highlight the importance of, uh, of treating that as an interdisciplinary problem. And sometimes we are not really able, like most scientists, they don't really have a training to develop nice medical illustrations like the ones uh, Jenny <laughs> produces. And this is exactly what should be happening. We should you know, consult with people like Jenny on, on, on items like that. And in preparation and talking with patients as well, right? In terms yes, sure. of effectively communicating that with, with our patients. Sure. I'd, I'd like to put you in touch with um, Otis Brawley, who's uh, working on uh, an intervention in doctor's offices about cancer pre primary prevention. And um, it might be he, he and you could work out some um, communication devices. <laughs> yeah. Just thinking about it. Any other questions, folks? I think Rob Sharp just uh, shared in, in, in the chat the top 10 uh, worst graphs. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm fortunate that we're not, <laughs> I'm glad we're not part of this, uh, of this top 10 oh, list. Wow, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is very, very informative, actually. Thanks, Rob. That's awesome. <laughs> That's really <laughs> All right. Well, very good. Thank you, speakers, both of you and your team. Um, very interesting. And I hope you can pursue this. I can see so much uh, utility in the cancer world, though, as you illustrated, there's room for this in public health as well. So thanks, viewers, as well. You tell your colleagues this will be edited and put up on YouTube shortly. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone.